Well, hello, greetings and salutations. Welcome to the video. Yeah, I know I said in my holiday greeting video that that would be the last video for 2015. However, I uh, came up with an idea here. I got a little time and I figured I would uh, kind of hang out with you for a while and show you some of the things that I do to manage music and video in Linux. And at the end of this video, I'm going to attempt to show you how I make the videos here on YouTube that uh, feature the Linux desktop, okay? Actually, uh, an easy Linux client sent me an email and asked me about this, and I ended up writing him back a long answer. And I thought, gee, I ought to show people what I do to deal with this sort of thing. Now, many of you already know that I spent a long time in radio broadcasting, and along the way, I started doing a lot of freelance audio production on the side. So I've done voiceover work, I have mixed music for bands, I have like demos and things like that, nothing major, nothing you would have heard. And um, just a lot of different audio related things. The last audio job that I had was I did narration for a film. So I have to be able to record pretty high quality audio and put it out in a high quality format. And around 2002, I started collecting MP3s. I started to build up a music collection, a digital music collection. Most of us who have played with computers have done the same thing. And at this point, I have quite the large music collection. Most of it came from well, my own CDs. I have about 2,000 CDs. Uh, a good deal of it came from my work in radio because the record companies sent us MP3s and I always kept a copy. So I've got a lot of music to manage, um, probably way more than most people. And I'm not going to tell you exactly how much because I'm afraid the record company will come after me, <laughs> you know. But it, yeah, it's a lot. I've got about 50,000 files between production music libraries, sound effects libraries, and then the stuff that I've done, and then the music that I have collected, I've got a great deal of stuff. It works out to be about 120 gigabytes of stuff in MP3. So what I do is I have in my folders here, I have a, a, a directory that is in my music directory. Uh, this is all my stuff that I've ripped myself. Uh, there's probably about 5,000 songs in here and it's all categorized by uh, decade and then as far as the files are concerned themselves the only thing that I actually care about is the artist and title I'm not big on having album covers and things like that we'll talk about that as we roll along here uh, so that's one part of it and then there's actually another hard drive that's hooked up to this machine that <clears throat> contains nothing but audio it's full it's an old drive that I have audio on. It's a 160 gigabyte uh, Western Digital Caviar drive. So anyway, if you install Linux Mint, the default music media player that you're going to get is Banshee. Banshee is a pretty good all-in-one player. It will handle things like podcasts and audiobooks and your music. It also uh, will play video, although I don't use it to do that. And uh, in Ubuntu, you get Rhythmbox by default. Many distributions put out Rhythmbox, and they're kind of half a dozen and one, six of the other, as far as I can tell. But I do like Banshee just a little bit better. And the first thing that I usually do when I go to set up Banshee is I will go through and turn off many of these plugins that are in here. Uh, they have Wikipedia, YouTube, audiobooks, library. Uh, there's just all kinds of stuff here. We got the Apple devices support. I don't need that. Um, just just a ton of stuff here. Internet Archive, Last FM, uh, Beats per Minute detection, Cover Art fetching. I definitely don't want that. So I just go through and turn all this stuff off, and then I'll turn it on if I should ha actually happen to need it. And Banshee will create files from your CDs. I cannot tell you how that works or how well it works because I don't do it that way. That's the next thing that we'll probably look at is how I get audio off of CDs into the computer. Now the player that I actually use way more than Banshee is this one and 
I'm going to show you some weird things as we roll along here because I've just kind of developed my own way of doing things. This is a program called Quintessential Player and it's been around for a long long time. I don't know whether it's still available or not. This particular copy that you're looking at is from 2003. And I like this program because it is yeah, I just know how it works and I'm, I'm very used to it. It's very reliable. I know what it's going to do and it supports Winamp 2 plugins. And I have a Winamp 2 plugin um, from a long time ago. This is also from about the same period in time, about 2003, I guess. And it's called Octimax. And Octimax is a, an imitation of, uh, it's a digital implementation of the same kind of audio processing that we used in radio stations. So therefore I was able to take this plug-in and figure out how to hack it and make it sound like when I play back music on my computer it sounds like it's on the radio which is what I want. So that's why I use this. This also does some other interesting things that will allow me to convert things to uh, WAV files and use that processing on it so then I could burn those files to a CD if I wanted to or send them to somebody. I can do all kinds of stuff with it, so that's why I use it. And it, like I said, this is an old Windows XP application from around 2003, and it's running in Wine. And it works quite well. I've actually associated my music files and playlists with it, so when I click on something, it opens up this program. It does what I want it to do. So that's how I play back audio. So let's talk a little bit about how to get audio from a CD. So we have a group of applications here that I want to show you. And yes, you can do all this stuff inside a player. However, I like, I've got so many files to deal with, I like having an individual tool. It gives me more control. So the first one I'm going to show you is the Asunder CD Ripper, which has been around for a long, long time. It's available on lots of Linux distributions. It's in the repositories. And it's very basic, but it does a very good job. And there's some things in here that it does very, very well. So let's zoom in on this, and we'll talk about it. By the way, the CD I put in for the demonstration is Billy Joel's 52nd Street. That was the first CD to be released commercially, the first album to come out on compact disc. And that happened in, like, really late 82 or early 83. This copy that I have in my system... I bought in a mall in New Jersey in 1987. So it's not quite that original CD, but it's pretty close and it does sound very good. So I just want to rip one file here and show you how this works. So I'm going to unselect all this. And before we actually do the rip, I'm going to go through here. I'm going to show you the preferences. Um, you can have this create an M3U playlist for each album that you rip. If you do it that way, I don't. I have it set to stick the files on the desktop and it automatically selects my CD DVD drive. By the way, I like to have a CD DVD drive in my machines <clears throat> simply because of the fact that I have about 2,000 CDs and probably another 500 DVDs and I like to be able to use them in my computer. Alright, and here is where you can set file names and those of you who are used to working with this kind of software will find this quite familiar. This is how you set the uh, the fields so you can create a file name I always have mine set up I just want to create the music file and I want it to be the artist dash title I don't want any other information in there if you're doing albums you might want album title and that sort of thing but for me this is this works okay now here's where asunder gets really cool and that's how it handles the codecs for encoding to files you can create a wave. You can create an MP3 as long as you have the lame encoder installed. That's in the repositories. The name of the package is lame, L-A-M-E. -E. If you want to create AUG files, that's already here. So you can create an AUG Vorbis file. And to tell you the truth, I wrote a thing on Facebook about this. If I had it to do over again, I think instead of doing all of the MP3s I did over the years, I'd probably encode them to AUG. I was playing around with that the other day, and it just sounds better. So... In future, I may encode uh, anything new I put into the system in AUG format. It, it sounds better to me, and it creates a file of about the same size. Now, with MP3s, they have uh, usually you can choose between variable and constant bitrate. I'm not a big fan of variable bitrate. That can cause problems on hardware players. Um, so I use constant bitrate. 
And anything between 192 and 256 is fine. You can set these to 320 if you want to. But once again, older MP3 hardware players may have a problem with the 320 kilobit setting. So this is to kind of sort of a broadcast standard here in radio stations. A lot of times when you get music files directly from record companies, they'll, they'll come in this format right here, 256 constant bit rate. And as far as using AUGs is concerned, uh, that also depends on your hardware. If you have a player that will play AUGs, great. Some of them don't. Uh, you know, like if you're going to be loading an MP3 player to take with you. So you might want to check that out first. But the AUG is an open source format, which of course these days I'm leaning toward open source. And MP3 is not an open source format. It is proprietary. So that's one of the reasons you may want to look at that. Of course, we have Flock, <coughs> FLAC Audio, which is a lossless compression format. A lot of people like FLAC today. A lot of people using it. It creates pretty large files, though. Your average song is probably going to be anywhere between 15 and 30 megabytes, which is, is kind of huge. Uh, and then we have other formats here, WavePack. And what's really nice about this, got WavePack, Monkey's Audio. What else is here? Uh, MusiPack, that's an old one. And... Then we have the AAC, which is usually what uh, iTunes music is encoded in. Uh, one of the nice things here is that you can click on these and check them, and then you can generate f files of different formats at the same time. That might be useful if for some reason you want to create an MP3 and a wave at the same time. There you go. You can do it here. So pretty groovy, actually. So let's go ahead and zoom. Let's go ahead and rip our big shot here our Billy Joel song, so we have a file to play with, so I can show it to you on the other uh, programs. And we'll get a drink here. I got a little frog in my throat today, and uh, so therefore I hope I'm trying not to cough in your ear as we roll along. I hope you have a nice beverage as well, and I hope you're enjoying hanging out. So the first thing it does is going to rip it, and then it's going to encode it. If you do a whole CD, it does that simultaneously, which is nice. So it can be ripping one track and encoding the next. It's not the fastest CD ripper in the world, but that's a good thing. That means it's uh, going to come up with quality files. You're not going to get pops, ticks, clicks, and gaps, and things like that. It takes its time and makes sure that it reads the CD and gets all the information. And we're done. And those of you with good ears probably heard the fan spin up on my computer. It's going crazy. It's like, you're encoding MP3 files and capturing video at the same time. Are you nuts? All right, we're done. So let me go ahead and close this. And it's all closed up. And then so we have our file here on the desktop. When the uh, Asunder CD Ripper rips it, Lame creates from the... CD uh, database data, the CDDB data, uh, a tag for the file, which is all right. Man, nothing wrong with that. And you don't have to mess with it if you don't want to. However, I like to have the, um, I like to actually pare it down. I don't want all the information in the tags. And I just want to make sure that I only have an ID32 tag on the file. So a uh, great program for handling that in Linux is called Tag Tool, and this works by directories. So you can load up an entire directory of files and go through and edit the tags, or you can create new tags from the file names, or you can create file names from the tags, and it'll do it automatically. So if you are going to play around with this piece of software, just kind of get used to it first. So we're going to select a directory, and we'll tell it Desktop. And now you see our file is loaded, and here's our tag over here. And I've noticed that I get a little garbage in here for some reason. I don't know why that is. Um, but it doesn't show up if I open it up in a player, so I, I don't know what it is. I think maybe it's just a little uh, weird thing. Now you can go in here and you can type your tag. Uh, I have it set to create only ID32 uh, two tags, so there you go. And the difference between it is that the ID3 version 1 is in the header of the file and it will not contain as much information. And ID3.2 is actually tagged on the end of the file, which makes removing them easier. So what we want to do is we're going to remove this tag. Okay. Tag gone. All right. 
because even if I, I don't want that tag, I don't want the one that was gen, uh, recreated. So I'm going to make a tag here. Uh, yes, I do want to save the changes. And my zoom went wonky. I noticed on the latest version here that it does that. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a tag. And the tag I have created is just simply the artist and the title, which is actually getting it, it's getting it from the file name. So if I click back over here to edit tag, you'll see that that's all we have now. That's all I want. That's good to go. It's ready to rock and roll. So now we have our file tagged. Now there's one more step here. When you rip files from a CD and you turn them into MP3s or whatever, or MP3s or AUGs, uh, you have the option to be able to set the replay gain, okay, which means that the file itself will contain a little bit of information that tells the codec that plays it back exactly how loud to make the file. And there's a program called MP3 Gain that allows you to do this. This has been around for a long, long time, and it's available for, I don't know about Windows anymore, but it's definitely available for Linux, and it works nice. And the way this works is, is that it goes through and it actually plays the file and it listens to it and it uh, figures out how loud it is on average and then it sets that loudness so that if you do this to your entire library you run this through when they play back they'll all generally be the same loudness so you don't get that situation where one song is really loud and the next one's really soft and the next one's really loud when you play these things back and it, like with, in my case, if I'm using DSP to process it, I kind of like an average input to the DSP so it doesn't get overdriven. And this is how you do it. So you can have this thing. First of all, we need to analyze the track. And if you look here, it says track analysis, and then it says album analysis. And what that means is, is that if you load a whole album's worth of tracks in here, you rip your whole CD and you throw it in here, and then the producer of that album for whatever reason wanted some of the tracks to be quieter than uh, than others you want to preserve that so it will find an average across all of those tracks for the album I don't do it that way I do it by track and um, so let's go ahead and analyze the track I do it like in radio In radio when we load everything into an automation system we all set we set it to a, a standard level across the board so like I said coming from that radio experience that's how I do it and it's telling me that this CD, <clears throat> this particular song, needs to be turned down 3 dB to match this uh, relative 89 setting up here. This, uh, what this, it, it, don't worry about what the number represents. It's just a, an average loudness representation. Okay, so this uh, this particular song is like 92.7, and it needs to be turned down. And the closest it can do is 3 dB uh, with MP3 files. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it loose and let it do it. And you use this button here. You can either set track gain or you can set album gain. And it's done. It's finished. That file now, if I put it in with the rest of my library, should be just fine because I always use the standard 89 dB setting. So now we have our MP3 file. And we're ready to play it. Get a little drink there so I don't cough on you. All right, um, so that's how you would create MP3s. That's how I do it. And, of course, yes, you can go and have it, do it by album. You can do whatever you want to do. I do it by song. And uh, at some point, I would like to, if I get uh, more hard drive space, I think I'm going to go through and actually take my physical CD collection and set it up to do it in albums where it puts each... Uh, each set of tracks in a directory and it has all, all that stuff and the album cover art too just for archive purposes now the next thing I want to show you is recording audio and this would be if you were trying to get sound from your microphone into the system or let's say that you were plugging in like a, I don't know a cassette player you wanted to take uh, music off a tape or a record or something like that and put it into your computer and create uh, digital files one of the best pieces of software to do that kind of work is Audacity. And Audacity is cross-platform. It is available on any 
uh, computer that you have, even if you have a Mac or Windows, and it, it all works the same. This is a great high quality piece of software. It will do multi track audio. So let's go ahead and open up our file in here. We can see what it looks like. And then you can export it in lots of different formats, and you can do all kinds of things here. Now remember, if you edit something here and then resave it as an MP3, you're actually going to lose some quality because. Uh, when the mp3 codec encodes audio it takes some information away if you do it again it takes more so your file sounds less and less good but this would be more for recording something from the microphone <clears throat> mixing a soundtrack for a video let's say or like I said taking your records or your cassettes and and archiving them digitally here's how you could do that now the piece of software that I use is once again we're going to go off the beaten track here I do not want to save changes is this little guy this is Adobe Audition and this is exactly the software that I used in radio stations for years and years to make radio commercials and mix things like promotion uh, promos and liners and everything this was the workhorse a lot of radio stations these days either use Adobe Audition or they use Pro Tools. Pro Tools is more geared toward a, uh, a more complicated music type production, whereas Adobe Audition is more along the lines of quick and dirty mixing and, and production like that. So the uh, really cool thing about it is that I just know it so well. I actually have been using this software since about 1994 Back then, it was called um, something else. It was called Cool Edit, and then Adobe bought the company that created Cool Edit. The name of the company was Centrillium, and they changed it to Adobe Audition. So I've been using this software for a good long time now, 20 years, and therefore I know my way around it. And it does this. There's there's all kinds of things you can do here. Um, you can uh, do multi-track mixing here, and then mix it down. So if we Go and look at the multi-track. There we go. It's being a little sluggish. I think it's because I'm recording video. And it's probably asking for the same stuff that uh, the video recording is, you know. So, but anyway, I mean, we can, we can create multi-track files here. Um, I can record in here. Uh, a lot of the times I use this. Okay, so let's go ahead and record something so we can show you how to mix. Actually, I'm recording back over my song, which I didn't want to do. Duh. Hold on. Let me stop that. Never mind. We can fix that. Let's revert to saved. And... Nope. And it'll just reload that. And yeah, you're hearing my fan spin up. All right, so let's go back over here, and I want to create a new file. This little tiny demonstration is now taking a great deal of time. Okay, so we go over here, create a new file. Those settings are okay, because it's just a demonstration. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, it stank. So now I've recorded my little audio, piece of audio here. I can trim it. I can add effects to it, I can fade it, I can do whatever I want. And then I can go back to the multi-track mix. And if I just wanted to like stick that on the front, then I could just stick that right there, drop it in here, and then I can move it around. Let's move this and put it up front there. We can zoom in a little bit here. I want to actually play it. So come up here and zoom in. And now I can line this up to where if it did play, it would be like right on. So you get the idea, right? Now, once I get done with this and I get all my files the way I want them to, I can burn them to an audio CD to give to somebody if I want to. And you'd be surprised how much stuff is still traded around in, in CD format. Some people want that audio CD. And if they don't want an audio CD, what they want is a some kind of a disc or a thumb drive with the media files on it. So if you're working at high resolution, 
you're not working at CD format. Sometimes you won't put audio on it, but you'll actually use a recordable CD or DVD or a USB thumb drive or whatever to uh, store that and hand it to somebody, or you'll upload it to an FTP server. A lot of times, that's how uh, audio is traded these days. But I can record a CD here. I can also use this program to rip an entire CD. It's crazy what it'll do. And um, I'm sure, the I've heard people say that Ardour, which is an audio editor for Linux, is fantastic. I personally have never used it. Uh, I don't do a great deal of audio work these days at all. So actually, uh, I'm just very comfortable using the old stuff. And the last thing that I wanted to show you, gang, on the recording side of things was this nifty little application, which is awesome to have around. Uh, this is the Pulse Audio Volume Control. Now what this does is it allows you to really control the input-output audio on your computer. And you can direct exactly what you want to record. So if you have an application that's recording, you can go through here and you can change where that comes from right there see so right now it's set to my uh, condenser mic but I could have this recording the output from Adobe Audition I could have this recording the output from the the input to the analog input to the computer whatever I wanted to do I could do here and um, you really start to appreciate this once you dig into doing audio on the on uh, a Linux box because then you want to route it places you want to do something so it's something to have around Linux Mint install this installs this by default um, pretty much every other distribution I've played with Ubuntu Fedora you have to go get it but it's in the repositories and it's easy to get a hold of so what have we looked at here I should have one more I should have uh, one more desktop available Oop. sort of playing my song quit that <laughs> all right let's go here this is the last one we're gonna look at and the software here is for video recording and this is what I use to make these videos let me try that one more time there we go I was hitting the wrong key that's the problem I wanted to switch to the desktop there okay never mind all right so the when I record these videos the program that I use is a program called simple screen recorder we're gonna try and open simple screen recorder while we're recording a video I tried this the other day and it worked okay so this is what simple screen recorder looks like when it when it opens up this is uh, the best most reliable screen recorder that I have ever used for Linux um, I used to use Let's see, I tried uh, record my desktop, I tried Kazam, there was one called iDate, I think that's, I or something, I don't know, I guess that was the way you pronounce that, and I tried that for a while, and that's no longer in business. The fellow who um, has uh, come up with this one did a real good job, and uh, this is available through a PPA. So it's not in your repository yet, probably will be very soon though, I don't see why they don't include it. But if you're running Ubuntu or if you're running Linux Mint or any Ubuntu spin, you can get this in a PPA. Just look up Simple Screen Recorder on the web, go to the web page. He gives you instructions on how to install it from a PPA. Uh, this is actually available in Arch, no problem. You just go find the, the it's in the Arch user repository. You can install it there and uh, you don't have to look at it. So if you're running Manjaro or Arch Linux, you can go get it. I'd have no clue how to put this in in Fedora although uh, the fellow who wrote it does tell you all about it so it comes up and it's in a wizard form so each time that you open it you have to go through this and that's kinda cool because that way you get to double check your settings every time uh, so we're using pulse audio for the audio and I don't mess with any of the default settings unless I have to so let's continue here's where we can choose a file name and what I need to do here for the sake of this video is choose a new file name because if I don't it'll try and record on the file that's being recorded right now and all kinds of goofiness will ensue so you choose that like I said I don't mess with any of this the Vorbis audio is just fine frame rates fine everything's cool just leave it on the um, default and it makes um, a make V 
video package, which is actually quite small. So that's awesome. So if I wanted to start recording here, I could. Uh, you can get a preview screen just to make sure that everything's working. So that's what that looks like. All right. Now I'm not going to start recording here because if I do, I will mess up the video that I'm currently recording. So forget about that. So we'll go ahead and close that up. Now once I have my video recorded, sometimes I do need to edit these and I use the KDN Live video editor. And uh, KDN Live is, I, I would venture to say, one of the better ones that you can get for Linux. Um, I've heard people say wonderful things about one called Lightworks. That's a little too complicated for me. And then there's OpenShot. I haven't had great luck with OpenShot. KDN Live works for me. It's a little bit quirky and it can be a bit hard to get it going on Linux Mint because you actually have to go out and get some dependencies by hand. They may have fixed that by 17.3. So there's lots of good information on the internet about KDN Live and you can learn more about it, but it does some really groovy stuff. I'm not gonna get too deep into it. Just go look at it. And uh, one of the things that's nice about KDN Live is that it, uh, the way it actually generates videos, um, you can make all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can really tailor the format to, <clears throat> to make nice files. I usually, when I do this, render to an MP4 format, which makes a, a small file that's easy to upload to YouTube. So, and there's also a, there's a YouTube preset in here that I'm not real happy about because uh, the video is fine, but the audio is terrible. So I just uh, do my own presets with MP4s. And finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about here was VLC, which is an, a video player for Linux. And you can use it to play back your videos and check them out. It comes pre-installed in Linux Mint. You will have to go get it for Ubuntu. There's also a stock one called Videos. Um, that comes with Ubuntu and Linux Mint as well. And uh, VLC will also play music. That's it, gang. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks for watching the video. Do check out freedompenguin.com. Check out Easy Linux on Facebook and check out Easy Linux on the web. Thanks for watching. We'll talk again soon.